Stadia, the platform that makes Wii U look like a Switch-level success. Things have been pretty rough for the cloud gaming platform, but Google will have you believe otherwise based on an interview that they gave to gamesindustry.biz. Here's the article. The headline kind of speaks for itself, but I'd like to take a look at the exact quote provided and then offer my own opinions on the matter. So scrolling down, Games Industry reports that developer marketing lead Nate Ahern tells gamesindustry.biz the platform is alive and well. Is it alive? Technically, yes. Now, is it doing well? I feel like that's a whole other story. He said, we're well on our way to over 100 new games launching on Stadia in 2021. Compared to other platforms, that level of rollout feels rather slow. It's still not at the level you'd find on Xbox, PlayStation, or Switch. Not saying that it's bad that a platform is getting games, but at this rate, it still feels like Stadia is playing catch up. And we're continuing to make Stadia a great place to play games on devices you already own. Uh, tell any non-believers to take notice of how we're continuing to put our words into action as we grow the Stadia Makers program and partner with AAA studios like Capcom, EA, Square Enix, Ubisoft, and others. And then when pressed for more information, Ahern said Google was focused on delivering value for our partners and on behalf of our players. Well, the main issue with Stadia is actually value. Customers don't feel like they're getting a whole lot out of Stadia that you wouldn't get out of or more out of on other platforms. The business model of paying for a subscription to take the most advantage out of Stadia and also having to pay full price for games that you can only play on the cloud that are internet reliant and when you look at the business model of something like xbox game pass which for a low monthly fee you gain access to hundreds of games an entire library of games on top of xbox exclusive first party titles coming to game pass on day one with that subscription service actually having significant first party support it just looks far better as an offering than Stadia does, and not to mention competitors like GeForce Now, among others. Now Nate points to Stadia seeing newer AAA releases like Resident Evil Village, but again, the business model of paying for a subscription to get 4K while also paying full price for this thing that you could get on other platforms and play on local hardware at more reliable performance and visuals that's where the crutch is. Not to mention that just releasing third-party games isn't going to be enough to sustain your platform. People need unique experiences for Stadia, but obviously that's not going to happen because Stadia shut down their first-party studios before they had a chance to release anything. Which games industry highlight? No first-party exclusives heading to Stadia, though Stadia does have this thing called the Stadia Makers Program, an initiative that offers support on everything from development to marketing support to studios bringing Unity-based titles to the service, so this mainly focuses on indie titles, but even those aren't going to be fully exclusive to Stadia, many of them are likely going to be timed exclusive and the like, so people can just wait to get those games on other platforms that are more thriving and that offer just a more reliable gaming experience. Moving past that and going back to this claim that Stadia is alive and well, I'd like to point out the string of events surrounding this platform. Near launch on November 13th, 2019, Stadia hosted an AMA that did not go particularly well with Eurogamer's report here from November 14th, calling it a train crash everyone is weirdly happy to be involved in, talking about how Stadia will have parental controls from launch day but no family sharing, meaning you'd have to buy separate games for you and your child's Stadia account, discussing all of the missing features that were promised but not present at launch. Other missing features or broken promises include an achievements UI, 4K, HDR, and 60fps on anything other than a Chromecast Ultra, the Buddy Pass, which would become available about two weeks after you receive your bundle, a bunch of multiplayer features like Stream Connect. And this is just scratching the surface, Ars Technica here, who released this article on the same day, November 14th, 2019 also released a bullet point of missing features that you can find right here. I won't read through all of them, but it's a lot. 
Then Stadia actually launched and media outlets got their hands on it and the overall critical consensus was that while at the time Stadia is the best way to stream games, it still falls short in almost every way that matters with both technical issues, lack of games, and the missing features alongside a business model that just isn't all that appealing. From there we saw plenty of backlash surrounding broken promises, namely how all games would be 4K and stuff like that, which they did in fact promise only for players to learn later that certain games would be upscaled to 4K and that natively they'd run at 1080p. Some games, even though Stadia had more teraflops than PS4 Pro and Xbox One X, would perform worse on Stadia than those other platforms. And right here we have from Phil Harrison himself a tweet that reads, Yes, all games at launch support 4K which obviously didn't turn out to be true. Then the following year, plenty of complaints about just how slow updates were being rolled out for Stadia, how slowly new games were being added. This is an article from January 30th, whose headline reads, Google responds to complaints of slow Stadia announcements. And while throughout 2020, we did see some features slowly but surely roll out, and we did see the free tier of Stadia finally launch, it just was a very low-key platform. There was just very little interest or coverage surrounding it. And then the major blow came on February 1st, 2021, when Stadia announced they'd be shutting down all of their first-party studios that were working on AAA projects that would be unique to Stadia, which further removed any incentive to invest in this platform. A platform does need those unique first-party projects and exclusives to back up all the third-party stuff. Google's always had a commitment problem with their products, and this goes doubly true for Stadia's first-party studios, which were established less than two years prior to their shutdown, which is not a whole lot of time. And so Jade Raymond, who was hired as one of the major leaders of Stadia, up and left. Then not long after, we got reports from investigative reporters like Jason Schreier talking about how Stadia missed sales targets by hundreds of thousands. And it was also reported how Google paid tens of millions of dollars for ports like Red Dead Redemption 2, among others. Titles from publishers like Ubisoft and Take Two. You know, they expressed their excitement about this partnership, but it's becoming abundantly clear that they were more happy about the money that Google was just giving them for ports of old games. Fast forward to the following month, March of 2021, and we'd learned Jade Raymond would establish her own independent studio, Haven, and she's working apparently on a new PlayStation IP. But Jade Raymond wouldn't be the only leadership figure who would leave Stadia. We learned just a few days ago on May 4th, 2021, that Stadia's VP and head of product was leaving Google. And even more recently, just six days ago, we learned that six more Google Stadia staff members have left the company, including former Stadia Games and Entertainment General Manager Sebastian pa Paul Puel and Corey May, former head of Creative Services and Publishing, Jonathan Dankoff, Pierre Mark Barub, Erin er Erwin, L y yeah, you get it, and Francis Denoncourt. And funny enough, all six of these individuals left Google to join Jade Raymond's endeavor with Haven. All six members have taken on new roles at Haven Studios, so we have still got a platform that's still lacking in core features. I mean, it only just recently got a search bar. I mean, think about that. We're talking about Google, the search bar company, being late to the party with a search bar for Stadia. We're still looking at a platform with a woefully lackluster library of games that isn't even getting unique first-party experiences. And the business model is still not something that's particularly appealing, especially compared to the competition. And optics surrounding Stadia look even worse, as we're now learning that a bunch of people, a bunch of key staff and employees, are straight up just jumping ship. People are so unaware of Stadia, in fact, that during the Epic vs. Apple legal showdown recently, it was reported that... There were a number of times in which attorneys have asked witnesses if Stadia has been shut down. There were two instances of that. And then apparently the number of times that witnesses were able to confidently say Stadia still exists was zero. And then if we look at the listing for the Stadia app on the Google Play Store and scroll down, you'll find that the number here, the number of installs is still sitting at a million plus. Now, I believe the next tier would be 5 million plus. The installs number doesn't keep track of exactly how many there are tiers, and I believe the 
app would have to cross the 5 million mark for this number to update. So we're looking at somewhere between a million and 5 million. I'm gonna assume maybe it's somewhere in the region of 3 million people. And for a platform that's been out for a year and a half now, that's just not great numbers. And it's especially telling that Google has yet to proudly disclose their subscriber numbers and the number of people who engage with Stadia daily. If the platform was doing well, trust me, this is what corporations do. They will shout and scream those numbers to the heavens so everyone sees how successful their platform is to ensure that there is an optimistic outlook for the platform's future to draw in more people. Google isn't doing that, and I can only assume that they fear revealing these numbers will only spotlight the dire straits that Stadia is currently in. So keeping all of this in mind, is Google Stadia alive? Technically, yes. But is it well? Based on everything we know right now, based on the history of Stadia prior to launch and after launch, that seems extremely doubtful. Can Google Stadia make a comeback as a true competition to other platforms and consoles that are out there? Hard for me to say at this juncture. It doesn't look super optimistic, but it'll depend on Google's actions from here on out and how they handle Stadia from here on out. But I'll be honest with you, when they shut down all of their first party studios, that's when my confidence in this platform hit rock bottom. Without unique experiences to draw me into Stadia, I'm just not going to engage with this platform that lacks features, games, and that has a poor business model. There are just plenty of other ways to enjoy gaming that feel superior and that feel more cost effective and that feel like they give you more value. And until Google fixes that, until they catch up on those key pillars, I cannot see Stadia taking off anytime soon. I mean, of course, the marketing lead of Stadia would say that the platform is alive and well. Someone in that position is practically required to say that, but looking at the history of Stadia and looking at things with common sense, you know, obviously, most people are not just gonna take his word for it. But that's just one man's take on everything. Let me know in the comments below what you think about this claim that Stadia is alive and well. And to be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out.